Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the culinary scene here at Roth Living in Denver. I am Chef Ben Davis, who is chef at the showroom here in Denver, welcoming you to this year's interactive Thanksgiving event so we can talk to you about the big day coming up here in about a week or so and the use of your Sub-Zero Wolf and Cove appliances to make this the most memorable Thanksgiving of all time. So we're really glad that you're with us today. Just a few little points of housekeeping before I get to introduce all of these amazing chefs that'll be working with me today in the culinary scene. First thing, the link that you use to attend today's class will also take you back in the future to a recorded version so you can review things, you can check something in the future. So just use that same link um, sometimes in the next week or so if you need to return. Secondly, at the bottom of the description or the link for this page, there is a URL link to all the recipes that will be prepared today in the class. So you can click on that link, download the recipes, whichever ones you would like to have a hard copy of or just view on your screen, you'll find that link in the description of today's event. And last and certainly not least, if you need to ask a question during today's event, please just use the chat feature, type in your question. Lynn Thielen is behind the camera today. She's gonna ask those questions to the chefs that are doing those preparations so you can get an answer as we go through. And then at the very end of today's session, we will have a question and answer session. So if you've thought of a few questions during the event and you wanna get them in, we'll save some time at the end so we can answer those questions. So without further ado, I'd love you to meet all of these amazing chefs that have joined us today here in Denver. And let's start over here with Chef, Chef Matt. Matt. Hello, Hello, Chef Matt, Matt from Kansas City. Hi, I'm Chef Gil from Denver, and Matt and I will be covering desserts today. Chef Alyssa from Salt Lake City, and Ben and I have the glorious job of doing the main dishes. I'm, I'm Chef, Chef Mike, Mike from Minnesota. From Minnesota. And, I'm and I'm Chef Ed from St. Louis. And me and Mike will be doing your side dishes today. And we're gonna actually start off with the side dishes because the turkey does take a little while to cook and dessert, we always save that for last because it's always the best. So I'm gonna start off today with a little bit of mashed potatoes. That's a staple in just about any Thanksgiving dinner that I've ever had personally. We're gonna do some mashed potatoes. I went ahead and steamed off some potatoes in our Wolf Convection steam oven. And I went ahead and did that at 210 degrees steam for about an hour. What this does is it makes sure that your potatoes are nice and soft, but you're not doing it in water, you're doing it with steam. So it's not soaking up any of that water and absorbing any of that. What we want that for is our cream and butter. So we're gonna go ahead and put them in our wolf mixer here. And when I put them in my mixer, what I like to do is I'll start my mixer and what this is gonna do is smash the potatoes real well. It's gonna get them, instead of ricing them, I put them in there with the whisk attachment and I'll turn it on. And then I'm gonna start adding cream and butter. So you turn it off. What kind of potato there, buddy? I got russet potatoes. Why russets? And some of the reason I use russet potatoes, I know if you look it up, a lot of times it's gonna tell you Yukon Gold because Yukon Golds are nice and creamy. Yeah. Personally, I like to use the russet potatoes because I feel like it has more starch in it and it actually soaks up that cream and butter. It'll hold more cream and butter. So what I do is I got a stick of butter per cup of cream. So I got one stick of butter and a cup of cream for this. But if you wanted to do a larger batch, you'd use maybe a quart of cream and a pound of butter. And I'm gonna add this in, so about one fourth of it, turn it on, give it a good mix. Now, important that that was warm, right? Yes, this is warm. Because it'll cool it off the, the potato too fast? Because you don't want to cool off those potatoes. That creates the starch in there. The more starch you got, the more of a taste you're going to get. So what I'm going to do is I add this in there slowly then. And by adding it slowly, what you're going to do is promote a smooth potato. So once these are nice and smooth, they don't have a bunch of lumps in it it's gonna soak up that cream and butter. Another thing is, once you get, what, while I'm adding it in four sections, is those starches in the potato will actually thicken the potatoes. So you can add more cream and butter than what you think. Once you think there's, you can't add any more cream and butter, add another um, couple ounces, turn it on, and it'll thicken up. And as it cools, those starches also will thicken up your potato and it'll allow it to be nice and thick like we have here. 
So you can tell these potatoes, I put a lot of cream in them, and it's nice and thick still. So you're going to be able to put that in there. They're going to be nice and creamy. The potato, I like to tell people, is the vessel for that good cream and butter. It gives you that flavor. All right, so if I got my potatoes done early on the big day, what are some ways to hold them? The way I'd like to do it is I usually cover it with a little bit of plastic wrap, and I'll either keep it in my oven on the one of my Wolf M-Series oven or E-Series oven on warm, about 160 degrees. It'll keep it nice and warm. Or you can put them right in your convection steam oven on convection humid. It'll keep all that moisture in your potatoes so they can stay warm. The warm mode is really a good way to keep any of your side dishes warm. If it's something that you want to hold moisture in, you can cover it. If it's something like stuffing, you put yours in, you can keep it unwrapped. You don't have to worry about all that coming out of there. And speaking about stuffing, we're going to go ahead and pass it over to Mike here because he's got a great stuffing recipe that we're going to start talking about. Thank you. I'm going to have you, since you pulled your potatoes out, go ahead and Absolutely. set that convection, Wolf Convection Steam Oven, to convection humid. Convection at, humid? At 350 degrees. So what I'm going to do is just a really, really straightforward and delicious dressing recipe. Now, I've got some Italian sausage and some celery and some onion and some sage, and it's all kind of doing its thing. There's some butter in here. The whole idea is I like to use a blend of sausage. So I like to use... What kind of sausage do you got? I like a sweet Italian and some hot Italian, both together. So a little bit of that sweet. You get a little bit of both, so when you encounter gotcha. that in that dressing, you get both pieces. So I'm just going to saute them. We brown the sausage first till there's just a little bit of pink left. And then we have these celery, onions, and garlic, and a little bit of sage just breaking down. I see you're not getting a lot of color on your onions. And Did you cook off the sausage first? Sausage first in the pan, and then the vegetables went right in. So there gotcha. wasn't that color. Now, I don't want these really dark because I want them to show up in the dressing. Now, for the dressing itself, we're going to use a combination of, gotcha, of breadcrumbs. We got a question. Chef, what are your favorite potatoes to use for your mashed potatoes? The question was, what are my favorite potatoes to use for my mashed potatoes? I personally like to use the russet potatoes because I feel like it absorbs more of that cream and butter and really gives you a lot of that butter flavor. It's it's Thanksgiving. Yes, you're gonna it's not gonna be the healthiest thing with all that butter in there, but man, these people are gonna rave over your mashed potatoes when you Put all that cream and butter in there. It holds together. They're nice and silky. Uh, if you have Yukon Golds, that's going to be fine. You're going to be able to use those. They're just going to not hold as much cream and butter, so you can back off that cream and butter just a little bit. Same with something like the red potatoes, where you leave the skin on. It's always a great choice when you use those as well, but it's going to be a little bit less cream, so it's not going to be as rich. And that richness is really something I like in Thanksgiving. So my choice is russet potatoes, and I like to steam them whole. Steam them whole in the convection steam oven just to make sure you don't get too much moisture in those potatoes to where you would have to pull them out of water and then dry them out afterwards. Beautiful. So while we're picking your best potato, I added about a third of the broth in here. And just to add that, I want to get all the little brown bits off the bottom of this pan, so it's a quick deglaze. And now I'm going to pour that over my combination of bread crumbs, of bread cubes here. What, what kind of breads do you use? I really like to use a combo. I like a little bit of rye. I like a little bit of French artisan bread, maybe a little sourdough, just a combination of breads because there's more interest in the varied color. A little bit different texture in each bread. A little bit well. different texture. Now, I like to dry these out. My favorite thing to do is put them in a bowl a day ahead, let them toss and get really dry. If you're not, there's instructions in the recipe on how to dry them the day of. Easy to do, too. So I'm going to take this whole saute pan here full of the sausage and the celery and the onion, and the garlic, and the sage, and it's going all right in this bowl of bread cubes. There we go. If you guys could smell this, it smells amazing right now. That and sausage now, and herbs, with everything the, has just really come together with that. With it's, the remaining little bit of broth and a couple of eggs, because what we're making is a savory bread pudding, right? It's a savory bread pudding, just like we would do. That's why I chose the convection humid mode in your Wolf convection steam oven. Here's the deal, that mode is so good for letting you get the brown crispy crumbs. You don't have to cover this dressing 
This is a dressing you can do uncovered in that oven, just like your bread puddings, just because it's going to trap all the moisture that goes in the cavity and cook and brown the top. It's not going to overcook the custard. It's a great mode. It's a fabulous mode for bread puddings, both savory and sweet. I almost explain it like if you would flip that oven up, that lid, it's almost like a lid of a crock pot. It's just holding everything in sure. for you. All right, I'm going to put this in the dish, and then we'll, we'll place this. Has the oven preheated over there, Chef? It's ready to go. It just beep. Let us know that it's ready to go. Fabulous. So it's ready to go in. All right, I did grease my casserole dish, so it just won't, you know, easier cleanup for us. All the sausage, the bread, the green of the celery, the sage, a little bit of parsley in those. Boom. This. It's ready to go in there. Chef, I'll go ahead and put that in for you if you want to tell them a little bit about your uh, cranberry relish you've oh, made. Perfect. Thank you, sir. So the recipe is included. It's not really something on screen, but it's not really Thanksgiving without some cranberry. This is my fresh cranberry relish. It's made with orange, orange zest, fresh cranberries. You never need to cook them. Crystallized ginger, just a little bit of sugar. And for that pop of freshness, mint. And it just makes for the perfect foil. It's great as a spoon by itself with turkey, a spoon in mayonnaise for sandwiches. And if you see all the liquid in there, great for a mocktail or a cocktail. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. All right. Back to you. Why are these Brussels sprouts so green? So we got our Brussels sprouts on the griddle. But beforehand, they're nice and bright because what I did was I put these in the Wolf Convection steam oven on steam, 210 degrees. I went ahead and got the oven going, got that steam going real well. Popped them in on my perforated pan right in the middle of the oven. Now they're still green because, they'll stay green because of that, And right? then what I did was I let it go for about two or so minutes in there, two to three minutes, pulled them out, and I shocked them in ice water. That really gets the chlorophyll and the vegetables nice and bright green. It also cooks them a little bit so that when I throw them on the griddle, and the reason I'm doing them on the griddle today is because the griddle's a great piece of equipment, and it's not something that you usually think of Brussels sprouts. But your oven's also so full of all your side dishes right. and your turkey. And you, your burners are full with other things, so great griddle's choice. Griddle's a great one. You great can choice. do them in the oven, but I love doing it on the griddle. I turn this, I put everything on there, I turn my griddle all the way up to about, well, not all the way up, 350, 400 degrees. It's going to go ahead and caramelize it. On the other side, I kept it a little bit lower because I got my bacon cooking. I got some onions caramelizing. So I did this for about 20, 30 minutes on... 300 degrees. Um, I started off about 200 degrees actually, then I went to 300. I think we got a question, so we'll get to a question real quick. I have a question for Chef Mike. Yes. The question was, can you make this dressing ahead? It is absolutely one of the things that you can prepare ahead. It refrigerates well, and then the day of, you just want to put it in your wolf, any wolf cavity that you have that you can warm up with. It's perfect for that. I'll also tell you, if you manage to get to the end of Thanksgiving week and you still have dressing left, this recipe actually freezes very well too. One last tip, if you want to do it gluten-free, just substitute gluten-free bread. Everything else in there is gluten-free and you can make it a gluten-free dressing as well. Yeah, it's a great thing. A little convection steam in your steam oven as well. Boom. Can hydrate it a little bit more. I always warm up my dressing in the convection steam oven. But like I'm I just said, dying to pick if you one got an buds. M series, it's great to Ooh, do look as well. Look at that caramelization on there. Right. That so awesome. once it's going, I just kind of give it a little toss. You're going to see all these Brussels sprouts are nice and caramelized, kind of like crispy, because mm. you just want a nice crispy Brussels sprout, and that blanching ahead of time in the steam oven gets them to where they're cooked a little bit, and you're not waiting, and the middle of them's not raw. You don't got to worry about them being raw. They'll be soft and tender and bright green and then caramelized. And it didn't hurt that your bacon was kind of rendering its fat. Yeah, and that, that was bacon running fat over here a little bit. Oh, all that. But yeah. to give it a little bit of more bacon flavor, I made a bacon aioli. So what I did, I took four pieces of bacon, cooked them about halfway. They're still nice and um, soft. So I put them in with eggs, three eggs, a little bit of bacon fat, a little bit of balsamic, and some grain mustard, and made basically a bacon mayonnaise. So with the bacon pieces, the mm, look at this bacon pieces, you got caramelized onions, you got the Brussels sprouts all on here. I'll give it a good toss, a little bit of Parmesan cheese. Wow. It's going to be hard to listen to the other two parts of this while this is still down here smelling so good. 
So I give it a little toss. It's kind of like a, a mayonnaise, bacon, mustard dressing. Mm. Once it's all mixed up, I'm going to throw it right on the platter. Wow. Finish it up with a little bit of Parmesan cheese. I can go ahead and turn my griddle off, get it ready for cleaning. And then I just top it off with a little bit of Parmesan. And it's a great dish. Fabulous. You can make it pretty quick. You don't have to use your oven. Utilize that griddle when you have it, and it turns out great. And like I said, if you don't have a griddle, you can lay these on a sheet pan with a little bit of oil. You can cook your bacon ahead of time, and you can go ahead and put it at about 375 convection in your oven, and they'll get nice and brown as well. But this is one recipe I love to do on the Wolf infrared griddle. So we did Brussels sprouts on the griddle with a bacon aioli. He did his steamed potatoes with cream and butter. Awesome sausage sage dressing, and then the quick and easy cranberry ginger relish. So the sides are done. Now we're on to the main event with Chef Alyssa and Chef Ben. That's my the main, the main event. event. It's, it's turkey, turkey time. time. And I'm going to be honest. I'm talking big turkeys. But when we get over to Chef Ben, you guys are probably going to think he's the winner, and because I already do. So, so I'm not going to tell you what he's cooking yet, because, because we got to talk turkey, because we all know people eat turkey once a year. And, and that's, that's generally because people don't, don't really like turkey. It's one of the trickier it proteins is. to cook. It is. It, it is. really is. It's so hard to get the balance right. It because you've got this white meat that tends to dry out because these thighs are big. Mm -hmm. Like, we got some big choo choo thighs here, so those, those take so long to cook. To cook. By the, By the time they're, time done, they're done, often, often the breast meat is just overly dry. The skin doesn't crisp up like people want. And so you end up needing to dunk it in gravy in order to eat it. The goal, <laughs> the goal today, today, I've got a unique, different, different turkey, turkey that, I'm that I'm showcasing today, today to give you something, something a little more, more fun, fun and exciting and hopefully delicious, delicious at the same time. We are doing a spatchcock birth. And if you didn't know what that means, we've got this beautiful little lady here. The backbone has been cut out. So you can see here now it's able to lie flat and you will also break the breastbone by pressing flat so you end up with this bird that lays down real nice. Doesn't she look good? So easy, yeah. She looks great. Mm -hmm. It's not as hard as you think. My biggest tip for this, you can't be scared. No. You, you gotta be bold, you gotta be brave. Absolutely. And sharp kitchen shears or a really sharp knife. Correct. And you wanna stay as close as you can to the backbone, cutting all the way down you will get a little bit of resistance, kind of close to that yeah, thigh, the thigh back. Bone joins exactly. Into the back. exactly. So you just use your muscles, don't be scared, pull that bone out and then flip it back over, skin side up. And what I do, and I think this is really, really important, with turkeys there's so many different ideas out there and don't worry, at the end of this, we're actually gonna have all the chefs talk about the way they do turkey. So this is just one person's opinion or the way one person does it. I am a dry brine all the way. I'm done with the wet brine. Right, absolutely. I'm, I think it dilutes it too. I'm totally absolutely. with you. Absolutely. It dilutes the flavor of the bird. A big bucket of water. Where are you going to put that? <laughs> right. You got to show that it has. If you've ever spilled a bucket of water, um, yeah. it's right. dramatic. It's traumatic. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. Now you got to pull the turkey out of the water, dry it so the skin will hopefully crisp up. Right. Or you can dry brine. You can dry brine. So absolutely. that's what I've done today. A dry brine, dry brine is simply is salt, salt and any and other any seasonings other you want to add. add. And what, and what we've, we've done, done, you can see this turkey looks sort of dried out. The skin is sort of leathery and it's tightened up a bit. Exactly. And that's what you want. So I do a mixture here. Generally, you just need a good kosher salt. And I do add a touch of brown sugar just to help get some nice caramelization. I think that pairs really well with a gamey bird. Absolutely. Helps to balance Absolutely. that out. And here I've also added a little smoked paprika. We let that go minimum overnight. I prefer, I prefer two days, days when you've got a bird this big. It really depends on the size. Totally. You know, the bigger birds, you want to let it go a little bit longer. For that salt to penetrate. Yes. Yeah, all the way through and flavor the meat all the way through. While it's also pushing the water in the bird out. And as, and as that, that water's water pushed out, out you, concentrate you concentrate the flavor, the flavor inside. inside. This, this goes, goes in your, in your fridge, fridge uncovered, uncovered so that the skin most dries yep. out. That's right. That's, That's why, why you have, have to have a sub-zero, right? With, With your, your sub-zero, exactly. right? You're going to get that nice drying effect overnight. So it's Without really going to... Exactly, everywhere. right? Exactly. So okay. when your cheesecake is in there with it, you're not going to worry about one tasting like the other. Turkey cheesecake, okay? <laughs> so that's what we did. And then we take it out either the next day or two days later. I like to let this get to room temperature. It's going to cook a little bit more evenly. And what I'm showing today is cooking in our electric wall ovens. 
You can absolutely cook a beautiful turkey in the steam oven. I think we have someone talking about that later. Yes. So we'll talk about roasting a turkey in the steam oven as well because it does a fantastic job. But for those who don't have a convection steam oven, you can have a fabulous turkey still. Yeah. So I'm here to show you that. Nice. So that's our prep. And actually, I'm going to show you the simple glaze I do. This is not your classic roast turkey with gravy. I'm actually glazing this with a sherry vinegar and Fresno chili pepper glaze. And that's going to give us some spice, mm -hmm. a little bit of heat, a little bit of acidity. Well, a lot. Right. Two cups of cherry vinegar. Right. A lot of vinegar. But that's you need okay. it. Right? You need it. Twenty number. Yeah. You need the vinegar. <laughs> and then just, I'm going to do about two tablespoons of honey. And I don't measure this in advance because I really hate measuring mm -hmm. just, honey. Just guess. Give it a little love. Yeah, right. Give this a little whisk. And that's truly your whole glaze. So that's done. And what I'm going to do now, I've actually got a beautiful little bird already done. I see a question. Give me one second while I pull this guy out, and Ben is going to switch me. Should we talk about the probe for one second? Before? Oh, yes. Pause. You, you got to use this. You have to use the probe that came with your oven. This is so, so very important, right? Because I think a lot of people are going to say, well, how long, how many pound, yeah. hours per pound, all those good things, right? The yeah. night, we, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes the probe, you're going to be ensured that you're going to get cooked to the proper internal temperature, which is so important. I mean, so many people say, how do I cook a moist turkey with a beautiful, crisp skin, right? Well, the moist part is you can't overcook it, right? That's really the key. So you can't overcook it. So this is the, key. the probe is the key. And now, you know, you're going to read a lot of packaging on turkeys that are going to say, stick the probe in the thigh, right? And, and we know there's bones in the thigh, and you want to make sure that you avoid it and all that kind of stuff. I have always found it's better to probe the breast than the where thigh it where it gets dry because pretty much if your breasts are cooked to the proper internal temperature, then your legs and your thighs, they're going to be the same. So you want to make sure you're testing in the thigh and in that thick meaty part right down here at the bottom, not up here at the tip, but right down in here where it's the thickest and the meatiest, right along that bone that runs down the middle. But don't touch the bone. But don't touch the bone. Exactly right because bones conduct heat much faster. So you want to make sure your probe is inserted properly. It looks like, question. Many. Okay, we want to get this in. First, the probe's going in. We're going to slide it up and into the thick part of the meaty part of the breast. And it must be fully covered. That probe has to be fully in the bird. And then Ben's going to get that in the oven. I cook this. I'm starting this off convection roast mode because I want as much browning as possible. With that moving air, we're going to get even browning and crisping, as you can see here. And we're going to cook it at 400 degrees. Very, very hot. So, let's get that in a second. What was the question? Yes. Uh, yeah, you, you don't need to spatch pocket, it, but you can absolutely do this beautiful glaze in your regular oven. Use the probe, and it's going to cook very, very quickly, and you'll be able to get something just as fantastic. Yes, another one. Of course you can do a traditional turkey. You don't have to do any of the recipes we're showing you today. We think these are fun, interesting new recipes to try. But you can always do a traditional roast turkey, which we have many videos and recipes already done. Yes, I think each one of us have done a regular turkey recipe this week on our YouTube channel. So you can find all of those. The question, what was the other question? Um, if you recommend a gas electric oven. Oh, gas electric oven. I will be honest, our electric ovens are quite a bit more precise. I find that they cook evenly with that convection mode that I'm using. But you'll have a fantastic turkey if you use a gas oven as well. You just might need to turn it a few times and watch for it. I would just go up to 425 degrees for that first 30 to 35 minutes where I'm getting a really nice browning. And then you'll turn your oven down, which I will do. As soon as we get that really hot oven going, I'm going to turn it down to about 350 and start glazing. Yeah, I think that's all the turkey questions, which is great, because I want to hand it over to Ben to talk about the good stuff. The good stuff. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm a big turkey fan for Thanksgiving. I always have been, right? But I know that there are those of you out there 
for whom turkey is just, well, it's a non-starter. You're not going to go to turkeys. Either they're difficult to cook, your grandmother doesn't like it, whatever it might be. There's a lot of reasons you might not want to do cookies, so, turkey, so you might want to do something different. So I've got a technique that I've done for doing a prime rib, right, for doing a beautiful whole beef prime rib. This is, could be obviously for Thanksgiving, but obviously you can now use it for Christmas or New Year's or anything like that. Right, but it's really sometimes difficult to get prime rib, prime rib, excuse me, even and cooked. So how do we do that? How do we go about doing that? How do we use the best features of our Wolf convection ovens to do that? Right. So what I've done with this is I took a standard prime rib, a full 12 pound prime rib. Right. And I have a first question. First question. A wet brine. Yeah. So doing a wet brine, um, can, if you just want to make sure that your concentration of salt in the brining solution that you use, right, is roughly 10%, right, of the, the solution in salt. So generally for a gallon of cold water or ice water, you're looking at somewhere at about three ounces of kosher salt dissolved into that wet brine, right? Um, you obviously, obviously want to make sure that the turkey stays cold, so you don't want to be just like brining it, you know, in the middle of your kitchen. It needs to brine for at least an overnight period, if not longer. Um, so you can, It'll take a bit longer for that salt to penetrate. It does. It does. It doesn't penetrate as quickly. It doesn't dry out because you're going to have to add the drying time as well. Putting a wet bird into the oven just doesn't facilitate browning. I mean, and brown food tastes better. It's really hard to, to brown something that's soaking wet, right? So make sure that if you are, are going to wet brine a turkey, turkey, it goes in for a minimum of about 24 hours at least, depending on the size, bigger, longer, smaller, shorter, right? You can flavor those brines. If you want to add a little sugar, you can add any form of sweetener, whether you like honey, brown sugar, you could use uh, agave syrup, all this, but you can throw onions and all of those things they're going to impart a minor amount of flavor but again it's more about the salt really because that's really what's going to help moisturize that bird right so again submerge it completely in the brine let it go 24 hours then generally i like to give it at least an overnight drying period which means take that bird out of the oven onto a rack uncovered into your sub-zero into your refrigerator let it dry overnight so you lose that wet uh, skin on the outside and then you can go ahead and roast it right but again wet brines generally I mean as Alyssa was saying is that it really does almost dilute the flavor and you think about anything where you add a lot of water it does dilute it a little bit so definitely go ahead and wet brine it if you feel that's better for whatever you're gonna do the other way I've wet brined if you need a if you can't get it into your fridge overnight I take a camping cooler I wash it out really really well I fill it with that brine and then I put the turkey in, I get a bag of ice, and I submerge the bird under the bag of ice, keeps it colder, but it also keeps it under the brine, which is obviously really important. You want it to be fully immersed in that brine. So definitely do that. If you are gonna do a spatchcock turkey on a wet brine, I would brine it whole and then spatchcock it after you've finished the brining solution. You can cut it and then dry it, all right? But again, back to that prime rib um, that we're cooking here for you. and so. Most important thing for me, get the prime rib, like the evenness of the color across the spectrum. I don't like a prime rib that's just medium rare in the central, just, uh, you know, three or fourths of it, and then the outside is a little gray, a little overcooked. So that the way we do that is we cook it slow and low for a long time. Okay, so my prime rib was actually salted the night before I cooked it. I just literally rubbed salt across the entire surface of the prime. Whether the prime rib is bone in or bone out, bone less, either way doesn't matter, but you want to give it that good overnight salting on a rack uncovered in your fridge. This is really important for pretty much all of those meats that you're going to roast, you're going to grill, you're going to do something like that. With it, you want to give that salt overnight. It helps penetrate, dries out the surface so you get better crisping, better browning because there's just less moisture on the surface. So you're going to get a nicer product in the end. Again, goes into the oven at 200 degrees, right? 200 degrees in the roast mode. Now, for those of you who own a, a, a Wolf uh, uh, convection oven, that roast mode, you know, is just perfect for a long, slow cooking process. Really does uh, make it so that it just cooks super evenly, but it still gives you a little bit of browning. 
Again, you're using that same temperature probe that Alyssa put into her turkey. You want to make sure that it's embedded in the thickest part of that prime rib so that you're getting that full interior temperature reading right in the part that's most important. Don't stick it to the end. Stick it dead set in the middle so that it browns in the middle. Again, at 200 degrees, that 12 pound prime rib was in the oven for almost five hours, right? Five hours to go from cold to 125 degrees for a medium rare, but also you could go, if you wanna go longer and go medium, get up to 135. Don't cook beyond that because you've ruined the prime rib if you're cooking it beyond medium anyway. So, all right, so we put it in, we brought it out, we let it rest. Then once we've got it, while, while it's resting, we're reheating the oven to a higher temperature, 550 degrees, right? So now we've popped the prime rib back in at 550. Now it's gonna smoke up your kitchen, so just remember to run your ventilation system. We've got all our vents on now. Right, but as it comes out, now you can see it's got a nice crispy exterior where all the fat has gotten beautiful and crispy, beautifully cooked on the outside. Right, and that's just about five, six minutes in the oven, right? I'm just gonna put my gloves, this is the hardest part of the day, we gotta take it off the rack. Notice too, I cooked it on a V-shaped rack. Keep it above and off of that. At home, please use tongs. I don't know if you've got hands like that, but that is very hot. So again, just wanna show you how beautiful and even the color is. And you're slicing right into that. There's a reason you're not resting right. it, right? Right, it's already been rested after it came out from the first roasting. So now we have even color all the way across. Gorgeous. Right, so you see how beautiful this is. And really what's important with the prime rib is when you go to get a prime rib at the market, buy the best prime rib you can. You know, get the one that has the best internal marbling where all that lovely fat, that's where the flavor lives. You definitely want to do that when you're going out to buy a prime rib. So, you know, save up a little bit, get the best quality prime rib you can, um, and then you're really going to be, um, it, it's really an advantage when you, when you spend the money on that. So just another choice for you for this Thanksgiving. We've got this beautiful spatchcock bird, which we're gonna present in a second. We've got a prime rib recipe for you as well. Comes with a beautiful little red wine jus that you can serve alongside of it, right? And all of this, right, leads up to the part that we really love about Thanksgiving, which is about dessert, right? right? We, we all love, love the pumpkin pie, pie something beautiful, beautiful and seasonal. Well, now, now we're, gonna we're gonna turn it over to our, to our colleague, Chef Matt and Chef Gill, and, and they're, and they're gonna, gonna talk all about the best part of the meal, the part that comes at the end. Thanks, man. All right, Gil. So, what so are we, what are we making, making today? today? So, uh, uh, today we're, we're making a little, little pumpkin, pumpkin cheesecake, cheesecake but okay, okay. our little twist on it, we're going to be using our convection steam oven. Awesome. Yeah. So, so are we using, using some moisture in the process? In the process? Exactly. exactly. We'll be using a little bit of the uh, convection steam mode. Okay. That way, we don't need to use any of those water baths or set up anything like that because we, we all know, you know, it's a hassle to get that in there. and. Then you have all this hot water that you need to take out. Sometimes so. you get a little hole in the foil, exactly. and then all of a sudden the cheesecake's sitting in water. <laughs> doesn't come out so good. Yeah. So. Okay. So yeah, let's check out what we got here. Okay. So in my stand mixer bowl here, I just have some cream cheese. Uh, and then we're going to just add a little bit of granulated sugar to that. Now, do you like to soften your cream cheese for a little while before it goes in? I definitely soften my cream cheese for this. Okay. The reason being, I don't like to get little lumps or clumps yeah. of the cream cheese throughout the cheesecake. That way it looks seamless and it's like one piece. I get, get a better mixing in the process and just silkier and creamier overall. Exactly. Awesome. Now so, I think people are kind of intimidated about cheesecakes and oh it sounds so mystical. But these are actually a fairly simple dessert to put together just following a few steps. Yeah exactly. So you know only thing that we have here that we've done beforehand is I've taken some graham cracker crumbs in, or in this case some ginger snap cookies which yep. I thought was a nice lovely little addition to our uh, pumpkin spice flavors that mm -hmm. we'll be adding here and all we're gonna do here is so they, so they could play around with regular graham crackers they could do the ginger snap exactly. I've done a Biscoff cookie on the crust before yeah, yeah. And awesome. so, so I've just, just baked that, that on convection, convection in the convection, convection steam oven for okay. 10 minutes. And now okay. I've let it come to room temp and cool down. That way it's all one piece. Okay. So in this mixer now, 
I'm going to start adding some of my flavorings here. So okay. for my flavorings, I have a little ginger or uh, a little bit of pumpkin spice that I've made okay. here. So this has a little ground ginger, some clove, okay. cinnamon, and uh, a little bit of nutmeg as well. Okay. All right. And I noticed that you gave them the measurements, but if they're in a hurry, if they're in a pinch, if they're just not sure if they have all those in their cabinet, could they use some pre-measured pumpkin spice? Oh, definitely. Okay. You can yeah. definitely just substitute yeah. out. Yeah. And the you know, same we talked quantity. about uh, we have an Indonesian family talked about using some Chinese five spice in this as well. Yeah, exactly. So you could definitely. There's a lot of different savory spices that go very nicely with the pumpkin. Yeah, I really like that little twist that you just said there. Yeah. It was uh, one of the ones I've actually done uh, just this month, so. Awesome. Now, next you're adding in, is this canned pumpkin or pumpkin pie filling? This is canned pumpkin. Okay, and that's really important because if you look on the ingredients, pumpkin pie filling already has the spices in it. Then that cheesecake's gonna be overspiced and a little bit too powerful. So make sure you get just pure canned pumpkin. Exactly. You don't want to be fighting all the other flavors that we're adding in this and make it a little oh. too overpowering. Yes. So I've just added a couple of, or a few eggs here sure. right at the end and a little bit of vanilla. And I'm mm -hmm. just going to kick this up a little bit and then we'll get to see our lovely uh, cheesecake mixture. Looks like it's mixture. coming together really nice. All right. That softening the cream cheese makes a huge difference on how easy that cream cheese mixes in to the batter and then it's just really easy in that it's so simple. Yeah, look at that. We're all about yeah. great flavors, but simplicity as well. You've got so many dishes that you're doing at Thanksgiving. You don't want to kill yourself by overthinking each thing you're making. And, oh, and this is the beauty of it. We're making this the day before, aren't we? Exactly. We're, we're, we're going to make sure that we're getting this baking, and we want this to actually set overnight so that that filling sets up nice and creamy and set so when we go to cook it. So how many days in advance could they make this cheesecake? Oh, you could easily do it a couple days in advance. That'll you buy you some time to do yeah. uh, all your other preparations, you know, that you need to do, yeah. obviously. Monday night, Tuesday before Thanksgiving, go ahead and get that knocked out, and then you're just not worried about it. And both of our desserts today we're making can be done ahead of time. Yeah, exactly. I hear you got a lovely uh, oh. salted pecan bar for us. So. Yeah. So what do we do next? So this is the most important part here. I've just kind of evened out some of that filling in there, and I'm actually going to wrap this with some plastic wrap. Okay. Wow. So trying to keep the steam in the steam oven. So it looks like you've got it at the Wolf Convection Steam Oven. He has it preheated at 225 degrees convection steam, which is it's an oven at 225 degrees but then it's also injecting some steam into the process. And that's where you get away with not having to do a water bath because there's enough moisture in the air that you don't have to worry about it. Exactly. It's not gonna scorch that cheesecake on the outside. And everyone's always worried that, you know, wrapping with plastic wrap, you're gonna melt the plastic. But at this low, low temperature, that you don't even have to worry about, which is wonderful. Nice. So I'm just going to wrap this one more time. Yep. It's really important to wrap it real well. I yep. like to do it over and under. That way, if you have anything, you know, especially some of the fat or anything or liquids mm -hmm. that might come out, that way yeah, it doesn't, butter, yep, doesn't eggs, seep cheesecake, out in yeah. your lovely uh, oven. Yep. I think that would keep the, the heat from also shrinking up the plastic a little bit. If it does shrink it, it's going to create a tighter seal, which isn't going to let that moisture in. Exactly. So as a result, so this cheesecake is going to come out very custard-like. Yeah. yeah, you'll, you'll see, see it looks a little under, but really it's perfect. So it's going in at 225 convection steam Kay. for an hour and 15 minutes. All right. So I'll just set my timer here. And the fantastic thing with this is, like you said, no need for a water bath. Make it the day before, day of, don't have to worry about a thing. No cracked cheesecake. Yeah. So that, that, that's such a bummer when you go through all the process to make the cheesecake. And then after it comes out, you get this big crack down the middle. Well, when you do a lower temp cheesecake like this with that moisture process, then you get that really nice creamy set to the custard. 
also don't have to worry about that cracking. So, all right, so let's move on. So we're gonna do my crispy salted pecan bars. So we're gonna move some ingredients over. Gil, why don't you move that over and you can set the food processor up there for me. Move some of this over. So I have a really simple pecan bar for you to bake off. This is a very simple recipe, but oh my gosh. It is so good when we're talking about all the right combinations of flavor components. Let's go ahead and set those over here for me. Thank you. Yeah, Chef, I see you went for a pecan bar as opposed to a pie. Is there any yes. reason for that? So, you know what? I love pecan pie and I love uh, a nice custardy filling of that, but I think people are intimidated when it comes to baking pies. They're just not sure if they can do the pie crust the right way, if they can get the crimp on the edge. Right. Maybe sometimes the crust falls down in on a little bit. Whatever it might be, it's just an intimidating factor with pies. Well, this bar is so simple to put together, and with just a few steps, you're going to get the flavor profile of a pecan pie minus that eggy custardy center. And as a result, also, we can we make this the day before, or at least several hours before, so this caramel can set, and it can set out at room temperature. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. You know, it's just, I, I like to say, simplicity is beauty. <laughs> I love All right, that. great ingredients. You're gonna notice there's a little bit of butter in this recipe. But we're gonna start off with, we're gonna make a shortbread bread crust, crust recipe, recipe in the food processor. processor. Now, if now, you don't, if you don't have, have food processor, processor, you're just gonna use a mixing bowl, and you're, and you're just gonna, gonna mix, mix for a few minutes until, until this comes, comes together. together. But, but the, the difference with this recipe is, is with, with this shortbread crust, crust, we're gonna use melted butter instead of whole butter. And it's gonna disperse itself, fairly simple with that. So we're gonna knock the flour off there, we're gonna add some sugar, and we're gonna add in a little bit of salt to the crust as well, all right? Now, and is there a reason for you wanting to use the melted butter instead? Yes. So people are very intimidated, and, and I get this question all the time. How do I know when the, when the fat is just the right size? And some shortbread crust has use a touch of ice water to bring it together. Right. Some use a little bit of egg yolk to bring it together. This, we're just going to let the melted butter and the food processor do its job. Okay? So now we're just going to shake this filling out a little bit. We're going to pour this butter in. And you're going to love this. It's so simple. We put the top on, power on. We're going to pulse this until it comes together. And it's already coming together right yes. here. Look at that. Really simple. I can lift the tube. There we go. Now I'm going to check it to make sure. I'll, I'll scrape that down real quick. All right. And then one more pulse. All right. And we are good on that. Beautiful. And now, now, Chef, I know that you're using pecans here, but say you had an allergy to pecans or something like that, could you substitute another nut or something walnuts, like that in there? Walnuts, cashews, um, pistachios, yeah, make another nut bar for sure. Awesome. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and dump the filling in here, all right, to the crust. All right, be careful going around there so you don't get that blade. All right, drop that aside. Now. We're simply just gonna spread this out in the bottom and give it a nice little press real quick, okay? It's about an eighth of an inch thick on the bottom and we're simply so pressing that in. Yeah, yeah, we're not looking for a really thick crust on this and I think you're gonna really enjoy. It's a very simple crust to make. So we're using a nine by 13. Let me move this out of the way for a second. Nine by 13 pan, I did line it with foil that's going to make it easy to lift this out once it's set up, okay? So now, now we're, we're going to turn, turn on our M-Series oven, oven to, to bake. bake. Now, now, wait, wait a, minute. a minute. I have, I have so many people, people ask me, me I, uh, there's actually something that I'll use bake for because we use roast, we use convection, we use so many different modes. Yes, yes bake is a great bake. mode. It's, it's a center of the oven, one pan or Everything's going to go in that center position, and you're going to set that oven for that temperature. Some, some recipes, we just don't want to speed it along. We don't want to hurry it up. We don't want to over crisp it or brown it. And we found with this recipe that it simply works. Can you set that aside for oh, me? It really works well on bake. We don't want to overcook these. Now, now, is that why you chose 
to bake instead of convection? Yes. Yeah, because I don't want to take a chance on those nuts burning. Okay. Now, next, we're going to take and we're going to mix a little bit of this. Oh, mix the butter, the brown sugar right here, and the butter together. All right. And we're going to kind of break this brown sugar apart. All right. Stir it together a little bit. So melted butter again, not cold butter. Yeah, Just very melted important. butter. All right, and then pour in the vanilla flavor for me. There you are, chef. There we go. And then this salt right here, another teaspoon of some kosher salt. We're not using table salt. We're using kosher. Oh, we got a question right now. Yes, and that's a great point. In the recipe that we're giving you, you'll notice that I did toast off these nuts about 10 minutes ahead of time at that 350, and we're not in danger of those nuts burning at 350 degrees for 10 minutes. You go a little bit too long, like 20, then you might be in danger of that. All right, now we're gonna pour in this mixture. Beautiful. Uh, butter and brown sugar, and we're gonna, we're gonna add, add a little, a little bit, bit of corn, corn syrup, syrup to that, that mix, mix as well, as well. Okay. okay? So, so corn, corn syrup, syrup is going to help us create this, this just this really delicious caramel that will not crystallize on us to where it starts to get gritty. It keeps that caramel really nice and smooth and crispy in the right way. All I right? love how so. that this isn't like a set caramel, you know what I mean? Nope. You don't have to know how, yeah. how to cook a caramel. Exactly. We're using brown sugar and butter and that corn syrup. Now, we're going to pour this mixture into the pan. And I've noticed that you didn't and blind bake that crust beforehand either. Nope. No need to bake it off because in the 25 to 30 minutes time that this is going to trick to bake, it's going to get really nice and crispy. All right, so we spread this out. Now, in the recipe, you'll notice that there is some Malden, Malden's one I like to use, but flaky sea salt, okay, looks like this. Okay, we're gonna do this to finish it, okay? I love that so, salty sweet combo. Yep, this is gonna go in the oven for about a half hour. And Gil, if you can hand me that real quick, I'm gonna show you, you set it right there. So these were made several hours ago, lift it out of the pan, and now see how beautiful that's set up? And if we simply cut a strip, Use a chef knife to oh, go down through there and see how easy Super clean. that cuts in the bites. And you know what? My family, Gil and I were talking about our family favorites. And, you know, our family is all about, we like lots of little small bites of desserts. These are perfect. This allows you to go in and get a couple of bites of something, and you're golden, okay? Then you can try some other things like some of Gil's cheesecake, all right? Yeah, look at so, that. So we got these dynamite desserts for you to try. Now, we're gonna go ahead and, and travel back in uh, to the kitchen with the chefs over here. And we're gonna take some of your questions regarding turkey talk, okay? How do you like to do your turkey, chef? I hear that all the time. And I will tell you, we've got multiple different opinions on how to cook a turkey. I've done one in the last couple of years. Uh, my family has a Wolf Convection steam oven. And we've been playing around with steaming it for about 30 minutes, and I know you're thinking, whoa, I would never want a steamed turkey, that sounds so weird. The steam is not going to cook the meat, but it's gonna cook the skin of the turkey to where after we've steamed it for 30 minutes, we're gonna kick it into either the convection mode in your convection steam oven, or you can use your M series or your E series, and, or even a gas oven, a wolf gas oven. And I like to do mine about 375. I like it a higher temp, I want to crisp that skin. I want to render the fat out of it so it's really nice and crispy. And then I always pull that at about 155, 160 at the most so that I've got that rest time. But that's a fun one to try. Um, if you haven't ever tenderized the skin before it's roasted, that's just another way to do it, okay? So what, what do you think, Mike? How would you like to cook a turkey? I think I'm going to go last because my method's just a little okay. bit different. Right. So Ed, what, how, tell, tell me your, your method of madness. Well, I really like the way that you just talked about it. It's, it's a concept that uh, I didn't really think of, you know, because that's kind of how I do it with my chicken wings, you know, steam them before you fry them. But with my turkey, I usually like to do kind of like Alyssa with the dry brine, but I, I keep mine whole. And one thing I'll do is I'll, I'll soften up some butter. 
I'll chop up some shallots, some garlic, and a bunch of sage with a little bit of lemon juice and put that and make like a compound mix of butter. And then I'll get underneath the skin, right by the neck there. If you lift it up under the skin, you can get in between the skin and the actual turkey breast. And you can stuff that with the butter to where when it's cooking, it's gonna melt down and it's gonna give you all that, that acidity. It's gonna give you that herbs all right into the meat. I also like to take my turkey, I'll throw it in the refrigerator overnight to dry that skin off with that salt on there, like they were talking about the dry brine, because it really gets that skin nice and crispy. So I'll do that. I'll go ahead and put it, usually I'll do it in, what I got is an M-series oven. So I'll put it in my M-series oven with the temperature probe running right down that breast like uh, Ben had said, because I feel like that really does work and it gets that whole probe in there. And then I'll do it at 375, and I'll just wait till that meat gets to about 150. Once it gets to 150, I'll go ahead and shut the oven off, let it go for another five minutes, then pull it out. Let it sit for 15 minutes, and it's ready to carve. Sometimes I'll even let it sit a little bit longer. It depends on your, the temperature of your hands and what kind of gloves you got. Because if you go right into that turkey and you start carving it, those juices are going to be real hot. So you really want to give it a good 20, 20 minutes to half an hour on that set time after you pull it out of the oven to cool a little bit, then you can go ahead and start carving away at it. So now that I've kind of told you how I like to do this, I'm going to go, go over and, and let Gil go ahead and tell us how he likes to cook his turkey. So uh, this year for uh, my friends and family, we're uh, doing an outdoor smoked turkey. So uh, one of the biggest things with that is, you know, what type of chips or pellets should I get? And so when you're looking at pellets or chips, whatever it may be, you're really looking for different type of flavors that you want to go for. So if you want something a little sweeter, a little less smoky, uh, I like to use like an apple wood or a maple wood. Uh, but if you really like that smoky flavor, uh, you know, some oak or hickory is definitely the way to go. Uh, as far as pre-preparations, I like either a simple salt and pepper rub all on the outside, similar to the dry brine method, but I just kind of coat it all around, and I'll even let that just sit on it overnight, uh, and then I'll put it in the smoker in the neck in the morning. Um, although you can definitely feel free to use a barbecue seasoning or something like that, and you can use that on the outside as well. Uh, you know, unlike some of these methods that we've seen here today, uh, it's at a real low, slow temperature. So you gotta really plan this out with your day and what you're making. So for mine bird, personally, uh, for like a 12 to 15 pound bird, I'm looking at 300 or 325 degrees for about anywhere from, you know, four to six hours. So real long, real slow, and one of my ways that I like to cheat on the cleanup so I have just less to do is I'll put one of those aluminum trays under that. It just makes cleanup way easier. So, and I know Mike has a non-traditional way to make his turkey too. <laughs> non-traditional <laughs> depends on where you're from. And you know, I have so enjoyed doing turkeys in the M series, in the E series, in the dual fuel, uh, spatchcocked on the Wolf Grill. When I am home, much like you, it's probably gonna be an outdoor piece, and I like to fry my turkey. So if you're one of the brethren that likes to fry the turkey. Brethren? Brethren, that means all of us. Brothers and sisters. Oh, <laughs> yes, but the couple of key points. One, you always wanna use a fresh turkey because it's never been frozen. You don't wanna ever interject any ice into a big vat of boiling oil because you have now got propellant and flame and all of that, so fresh turkey. I like your dry brine method because the whole idea is just to dry that out so that when I, the skin out, so when you fry it, it's super crispy. Sub-Zero, holding that turkey 24 hours in that Sub-Zero makes it perfect because I don't want any water pockets in there. And if you don't, if you're frying for the first time, please, Follow the instructions in terms of measuring the displacement of oil in your pot so that you don't end up with a bad party on Thanksgiving Day. It is a really great way. Now, why would I ever fry it when I have all this beautiful equipment? It's all full of sides. I've got sweet potatoes and regular potatoes and Brussels sprouts and dressing. So, if you happen to do the fry method like I do, 
I'll see you outside on Thanksgiving. <laughs> so I know we've covered a ton of things on turkey and other items. Now we'd just like to open it up, Lynn, to any questions anybody has. We are ready to get you comfortable for the big day. So the question was, going back to the Brussels sprouts, can we use that recipe for other vegetables? Absolutely. Out of that bacon aioli, you can use that as a dip. You can use that on carrots. You could use that on green beans. Add a little bit of mushrooms. Add that to your green beans, and you basically got a quick green bean casserole. Anything that you, any kind of vegetables that you want to brown up, you put that right on the griddle there, it's going to give you that ability to get the nice crispiness. You could use that for potatoes, beets, anything that you want to interject that, that bacon flavor. And, and I, if you're anything like any of us, bacon, it goes good with just about anything. So Those you could use that same recipe, that aioli, the caramelized onions, add it to your favorite vegetable. The cook time might be a little bit different, but you can blanch any vegetable like I did in the convection steam oven. You might be a little bit less. You can do your broccoli that way. Any green vegetable is going to get a lot brighter. So any vegetable you'd like to use in that recipe is going to work great. Agree. So the question is, how would we cook a stuffed bird, right? A stuffed whole turkey, I'm assuming that not spatchcocked, obviously, without having a convection steam oven. Well, obviously, you know, you wanna use your Wolf convection oven, whether you have a dual fuel, M series, E series, you've got all those choices on there on how to cook it. And you saw Alyssa use the convection roast mode, in my opinion, and this is, you know, obviously open to debate with all the other chefs here, but I love that convection roast mode when I'm roasting something that I really wanna get cooked as quickly as possible. Because remember, any nice piece of meat, poultry, fish, all those kinds of things, really high quality, high end pieces. And I include turkeys in that category, right? Because you really want that internal temperature to be spot on, right? You don't want to undercook it, but you certainly don't want to overcook it either, right? So by in placing that nice piece of meat in a very hot, efficient oven, which is exactly what any of those convection ovens is using the convection roast mode, right? You're gonna get the most efficient use out of your oven. That oven's gonna cook it as fast as possible because you're subjecting then that nice piece of meat to that hot temperature for the shortest amount of time. So what I like to do, I like to start my oven hot, like 400 or north, right? When we're talking about that, get that skin starting to crisp and then lower the temperature down, bring it down in that 325, 350 range, but again, remembering that your oven is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you. That little bit of broiler, that consistent fan driving the air around your turkey, it's gonna cook it very, very quickly. It's gonna make that, that stuffing cook all the way through. When you test your bird with the stuffing in it, just remember, you know, you're getting that breast to 155 to 160, you're pulling it out to rest. I can pretty much guarantee that your stuffing is fully cooked. You're not gonna have to worry about you know, having like mushy or undercooked stuffing. In fact, I stuff my bird every year. I'm not one of those who, people who believe that I'm gonna poison everybody because I'm cooking um, my bird with the stuffing in it. So again, start on that convection roast mode. I like to start hot and then move it lower, cook it slower. I think you're gonna find that that mode is gonna be the most efficient, best way to roast it in an oven other than a convection steam oven. Okay. 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 So I would do convection. You've already brined it. You've already got a lot of moisture. And I would, as they've said, start on the higher end of temperature. I'd probably start around 15 to 425 and then lower the temperature down after 30 minutes. Um, you're going to find that you really don't need to rotate the turkey in the process. It cooks very evenly throughout. You can kind of keep an eye on it and pull it out, see if it needs a little bit of rotation or turning. Uh, but make sure you use the, the temperature probe so that it's monitoring it the entire time. 
Um, if you want a little bit of extra crisping or browning, you can start off with convection steam and then turn the steam off after 20 to 30 minutes. Um, it's something that you can really play around with um, periodically and see what you like the best. And the advice that I give uh, people also when it comes to cooking turkeys is don't eat turkey just once a year. Play around with the year. They sell turkeys in the grocery store and in the markets throughout the year. Play around. You've got beautiful ovens in your home that do all these things. You might come up with four or five different ways to cook a turkey um, that you like, that you just pick your favorite for that year. Um, that's what we do is we pick up some, some different turkeys throughout the year. We'll have turkey in April. We'll have turkey in July. And we cook it different ways. But yeah, uh, play around with it with or without that moisture. Make sure that you dry the bird off really well. If I do a wet brine on my turkey, then I will pull it out, rinse it, and let, let it dry for a day before I'm roasting it. Okay. Homemade rolls. Oh, steam oven is the perfect choice for that. When you're thinking about everyday baking or never, I never baked before, your steam oven is going to be your best friend. First of all, you're going to need to prepare them the dough the same, it has to proof. Steam oven, as well as all of your other wolf ovens, can be converted to a proofing chamber. So that's where the dough doubles in size. That's always helpful. All of them will do that. And then I would use auto steam bake. This is where it takes all the guesswork out of how you're going to prepare these rolls. In fact, I think there's in gourmet baked goods, there's a mode called rolls. Yeah, rolls yeah. and so all I would do is go to that mode once my rolls are formed and proofed and risen and let the oven do all the work. I think the only question it's going to ask you is what color do you want the crust? So the question is how to reheat your prime rib after it's already been cooked. Now, you know, it's gonna be really hard to get it exactly where it was before, just because you've already reached that temperature and especially if you've sliced that piece of meat, um, it's gonna be hard to get it back to it. But if it's still in a larger format, I recommend using, if you're using your CSO or your uh, convection oven, using a probe in with that and reheating that um, with some of our reheat modes, which is one of the most foolproof ways of doing that. You can even set it to reheat to exact temperatures and it'll notify you when it reaches that temperature. That way, hopefully, you know, you don't end up with a well done roast uh, and it'll maintain that medium rare, medium, or however you like it. Yeah, I don't think people realize they can use probe on reheat. That's a, yeah, that's a big plus. and that's also fantastic for any of your side dishes too. So if you make those in advance, feel free to use that probe, insert it all the way, and make sure it reaches that uh, reheating temperature. You know, I do know there was a question. Uh, Turkey-wise, someone asked if they could cook the turkey the day before and then just reheat it on Thanksgiving. And that's a point I think that's really useful and important for people to know because you can. I know the day of Thanksgiving gets crazy, especially if you're doing the whole meal at your home and you have everyone coming over. A turkey does so well if you cook it the day before. You want it to rest all the way and then you'll want to carve it. After it's been carved, set it on a, the platter you're going to use or on a baking sheet and you're going to want to cover that. Oftentimes I'll take some of the extra juice that the turkey has given off and kind of pour that over just to keep it super moist. Cover that really tightly put it in your fridge the next day, pull it out, let it get to room temperature, and then I would say it takes about an hour, and I reheat it slowly in the oven at about 325 to 350 degrees, and you won't have to let it rest. You'll be able to pull it out and eat a nice, warm, beautifully done turkey right then on Thanksgiving, and truly, sometimes it tastes better because the meat has just like come together and really become a really nice texture. So that person, I wanted to make sure that we answered that question.
So, Julie, with your new induction cooktop and a new speed oven, right? Those are the two pieces? Yep. Okay, your speed oven, what it's going to offer you that you didn't probably have before is a combination mode where you can use both dry heat and low-level microwaves. That's what that speed part of the speed oven is. So if there's a side, and if you look at the size of that, the box is small, yeah. but you can get a four-quart casserole in there easily. Mm -hmm. So. If there's something that you need to cook a little bit faster, I would say that micro bake or that micro roast mode is low level microwaves and then dry heat. So think about uh, any of these that would benefit from a little bit quicker cooking time. In terms of your induction, you have a giant, beautiful trivet in your kitchen. Anything that comes out of your oven, this is a perfect surface to land it on, holding your gravy, warm for the entire meal, right? Induction, Alyssa's using induction right here. Perfect for that, because you know why? You have infinite control. It is at the super most reactive in terms of how quickly you can control that temperature. Perfect for holding things on Thanksgiving when you got a lot going on. All your sauces, all those things that need are liquid, liquid that, that need, need to be held, induction, going down to those low temperatures, you're not gonna scald, you're not gonna burn, you're not gonna do anything to, to ruin it. So that's when you might make sure you use induction at its fullest range. Don't just use the, the powerful, powerful part. part. Use the low, use the low, low part because that's, that's where, where it really is. Really now, if you're not Julie and you don't have the induction, Wolf gives you that control through the lower range on every one of its gas burners. We got that simmer cycle, Absolutely. it'll hold everything. So Absolutely. it's perfect for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Great question, Julie. Yeah. In the steam oven, I would I would did about a 16 pound turkey a couple weeks ago, and I think it took about an hour and an hour and a half. Is that about what time? So I, I did about a, about an hour and a half, and you're going to be able to know a little bit with that probe in there. It's going to show you the temperature, and you're going to see how quickly it's rising. Once you get it up to about 140, 130, 40 degrees. You want to want to keep an eye on it because it's going to come up temperature a lot quicker once you get there. So it takes a little bit to get that bird, especially if it's right out of the refrigerator. Always recommend you let it sit out and get a little bit to room temperature. It'll help that cooking process a little bit quicker. So when you are prepping, pull that out, let it get a little bit to room temperature, put it in your steam oven with that probe. Once it gets it all that cool knocked off, it gets up to about 130 degrees. It's going to go quick up to that 150, 160 mark. So you're going to know you got about 15 to 25, maybe 30 minutes. Once it gets to that 130, it's going to get it up there real quick. And having it come out earlier than later. later. Absolutely. Be better, better for the turkey to get done earlier. earlier. That's a good thing. You can, that, always, you can always cook it better, yeah. but yeah. you can't undercook yeah. yet. Yeah. They haven't came out with that yet. I think, I think that, you know. So letting, letting that turkey rest. So many people want to eat their turkey right out of the oven, but it's so hot, you literally can't discern some of the flavors, whereas when it cools down, then all the flavor profiles come in. So. Well, that was exactly Alyssa's point about doing one in, in advance, mm -hmm. yeah. by letting it completely rest and chill all the way down. All that moisture coalesces in the bird, so when you reheat it, now you're having a really moist bird instead of cutting it immediately, and all that moisture just evaporates and you have a dry bird. So. One observation on those times is with any of the wolf ovens that I've ever cooked a turkey in, it has been closer to eight to 10 minutes a pound as opposed to the 13s or 14s that you see online. Yeah. So use your probe, you'll know exactly what's going on, but don't expect it to be as long because why? It's a great oven, it's right? It's, it's a great oven. Better. Yeah. And I think we should also <laughs> know. Um, if you're getting a bird that was previously frozen, it more than likely has been brined. So you don't need to do a brine on it. Number two, there's a little plastic thermometer that's supposed to pop when it gets to a certain temperature. Okay, throw that thing away. Pull it out, throw it away. You don't want to use that. 
Um, if, you, if you have a Wolf gas oven and you're roasting the turkey in your gas oven, then use a little digital instant read thermometer to check the, the temperatures on that. Don't go by the little popper because I believe those poppers, they go about 180 and it's in the breast, which means that turkey's gonna end up being a little bit on the dry side. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's not really gonna, it's not. Sure. Well, you're, you obviously are going to be planning those things that are going to hold temperature the best. What are going to be those items you can make in advance that are going to hold the best, not degrade over a certain amount of time held in a warming oven, wherever it might be. So obviously things that are dense, like mashed potatoes, things like the stuffing, you know, those things can, the dressing, they can hold much better than say the vegetables are going to hold. And you're going to lose the, the structure on your vegetables much faster than you would on these items. So again, as everybody's kind of pointed out, don't be afraid. A lot of times you make your mashed potatoes a little bit early. Great. Put a little layer of plastic, put a little foil on there, hold them in an oven that you're using as a warming oven, whether it's your M series, E series, you can have a warm function, even on your convection steam oven. And if you had the foresight to put a warming drawer in your kitchen, by all means, use that warming drawer. I think Ed said, you know, great uh, temperature for holding food that you've just prepared is about 160 degrees. It's ideal. Keep it nice and hot, but again, cover it so that surface temperature doesn't dry out. The plastic wrap, again, holds the moisture. The foil holds the heat. Put that in your warming drawer, but again, use the convection steam oven to prepare those items that can stand a little bit longer, that could be reheated slowly, much in the way that we were, that Alyssa was talking about reheating that turkey, right? That's, those are the kinds of things you want to think about. What's going to reheat the best because it's got the density, it's going to hold that moisture a lot better, and what's not going to dry out the fastest. So again, those items that can be held longer are going to be the denser ones. And then you just go from there and do the last minute stuff, you know, whether it's your vegetables, whatever it might be. You know, you saw Ed, how quickly he put those Brussels sprouts together. The beautiful thing is he could have steamed those Brussels sprouts off yesterday and then just finished them today. So don't think that all the prep has to happen on Thursday, right? You know, plan your week out. What can you do ahead? Use those appliances to their best um, uh, it, it, um, uh, attributes. So you're, you're steaming those vegetables, you're blanching them, you're holding them in your sub-zero. Then when you're ready to go, boom, they're just right on the griddle, nice and hot, finished really quickly, literally at the last minute while somebody's carving the turkey, you're finishing the vegetables. They're going on the table nice and hot and fresh. All right. So it looks like that was the last question we've had. So we want to thank everybody for joining from wherever you are across the Roth universe. We can't, we can't thank you enough for tuning in and letting us come into your homes and hopefully give you a, a little bit of, a, you know, a little... Uh, relief from the stress that Thanksgiving might cause. You know, we're always here at the culinary scene, um, trying to make as much uh, really positive and informative content as we possibly can about the use and the care of all Sub-Zero Wolf and Cove appliances. So from all of us here uh, at the culinary scene and at Roth Living, we want to wish you all the very happiest of Thanksgivings, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon right here on the channel. Time to eat. All right, time to food. Holiday, guys. Thanks, guys. <laughs>